scientist, I'm, I'm curious to, to learn what, what other people are, are doing in the area. Given that we are both located in the Orlando area, I, I, I think you know, it would make sense that we talk to each other. Also learn about your modeling and simulation program. And uh, from what I understand, it has a slightly different spin uh, compared to what we do. So, uh, which is usually a good thing because there is a, a chance to be synergistic and uh, to combine forces. So I, I figured I'd swing by. And Dr. Biarrell is also here from our center uh, to uh, tell a little bit more about um, what we do and uh, maybe spark some interest. And uh, I'll be, of course, then happy to, to answer like any questions. And uh, you know, if something comes out of it, uh, that would be great. If 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 not, then you know, at least you have uh, heard a little bit about what we are up to. All right. So uh, I'd also like to thank Sabrina, of course, uh, for uh, for hosting me here today. She has been uh, fantastic uh, in getting this together. And I apologize for the late announcement. That was completely my fault because I, I'm chronically behind my email inbox. Anyhow, so she mentioned that. Uh, um, I'm uh, working for the University of Florida in Lake Nona in the Center for Pharmacometrics and, and Systems Pharmacology. Uh, I'm more originally not a uh, pharmacometrics and quantitative person. I have a pharmacy background uh, from Germany and then came here about 12 years ago as uh, originally as a pharmacy exchange student uh, to Gainesville to University of Florida. And um, basically that uh, uh, six months that I spent there uh, piqued my interest in doing something else uh, with my life rather than uh, you know, being in the pharmacy and, uh, and uh, being directly involved in patient care. So I uh, completed my PhD at the University of Florida and uh, did this primarily in uh, PKPD, so pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of anti-infectives and looked at a variety of uh, experimental settings uh, starting from in vitro settings uh, where we measured basically how quickly uh, drugs either uh, in isolation or in combination, kill off bacteria uh, at various concentrations. But we also did a, a variety of uh, clinical experiments where we, for example, measured in the in the OR uh, tissue concentrations uh, in patients, so to see if, uh, for example, antibiotic concentrations are high enough uh, uh, during surgery to prevent post-operative wound infections. After that, I. I said, okay, let's then switch focus again. And so I went to the Netherlands for three years for a postdoc uh, and worked for the uh, uh, public private partnership, the uh, TI Pharma Consortium, which is a uh, partnership out of industry, academia, and uh, uh, universities. And I was part of the modeling and simulation platform. And then I came back about uh, four and a half years ago to the Center for Pharmacometrics and uh, Systems Pharmacology. And we basically started out with. Um, so we basically started out with uh, Dr. Lesko um, and I uh, in, in Lake Nona. Uh, so with two uh, people, and since then, the center has grown uh, substantially uh, to about uh, uh, five faculty that we have on site. So Dr. Lesko, uh, myself, Dr. Polita, uh, Dr. Birel, who is here, and, and Dr. Drama, and uh, we have two faculty in, uh, in Gainesville. So that's Dr. Dierndorf, uh, who is also my PhD uh, supervisor, and then Dr. Hockhaus. And so basically our mission is to the, the advance drug development and regulatory science through innovative uh, translational research, education, and scientific multidisciplinary collaborations with industry, FDA, and at age academia foundations, and other public entities with a focus on quantitative clinical pharmacology. So it's a very uh, wide uh, range of things that we do. And uh, I, I dare to say that I'm uh, somewhat different or that we are somewhat different from a uh, traditional academic center where I have uh, one particular uh, area of interest and a particular focus group. I put more or less the, the tool in the center, so modeling simulation tool in the center, and then applied uh, to different clinical questions to answer clinically relevant uh, research questions. So why do I show this graph? Well, uh, I said already that we work closely with uh, both the US uh, Food and Drug Administration as well as pharmaceutical industry. And when you look at this graph here that you see that uh, for the amount of money that you spend since the 1950s, you have a much lower uh, return on investment uh, 
in uh, late years. And it's now um, estimated that in order to bring a new drug on the market, it costs about $1.8 billion, yeah, which is a huge amount of money. And so, of course, uh, that leads also to expensive drugs. And uh, companies have to recover that. And that has also led to the fact that uh, pharmaceutical companies have uh, backed out of development of, of drugs that are taken for a short period of time, such as antibiotics, which then, uh, of course, can lead to a huge uh, health crisis. So um, much of this cost uh, is due to uh, large-scale failed clinical trials, so particularly phase two and phase three clinical trials. And that's basically one of the traditional areas where modeling and simulation comes in, uh, in, in a sense that we use mathematical and statistical models to uh, integrate available data from in vitro, animal, and clinical settings. Uh, so for example, from phase one or two A studies to inform dose selection or selection of uh, patient subpopulations for the next phase clinical trial. Uh, so for example, for phase two or phase three clinical trial. And so in the end, so we apply um, mathematical model and simulation tools uh, to enhance this. Um, there are a couple of questions that, uh, from my point of view, are uh, key to success for, um, um, for application of modeling and simulation tools in drug development. Of course, first thing you want to know, who's my patient? So it's not just that we uh, put numbers and data in a computer and then just uh, let it work and see what happens. But we also need to have, of course, a fairly good understanding of who the patient is, uh, what the disease is, what the symptoms are, what the underlying pathophysiology is. So we work uh, very closely with uh, a lot of uh, uh, medical professionals, uh, as, as well as biologists, uh, to get a good handle on, on what that means. Uh, of course, then the next thing is um, disease typically manifests itself through disease biomarkers. And I'll uh, use an example, type 2 diabetes. Uh, to tell a little more about how this information is used. That we need to understand pathophysiology and then, of course, uh, and identify right organs. And I think that's, uh, I spoke to some of you early on uh, here this morning. That's probably something that you do with like organ on a chip, for example, to see what the potential drug targets are. And that's basically where we come in, is to define the dose-response relationship and uh, understand the concentration time profile and the effect of the time profiles. So there are historically three questions that define um, uh, the context for modeling and simulation. So what do we want to know? How certain do we want to be? And uh, what are we willing to assume? Yeah. So this uh, paradigm was uh, first brought up by Lou Scheiner, and he uh, is one of the forefathers in the pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic modeling and simulation. And it's important to know that not, uh, not every model for really no more can address all questions of interest. Yeah, they should be geared to address a specific question of interest. And uh, so in essence, they are fit for purpose. Yeah. And so you may have to have like different models, or then also be linked models to uh, address that questions arising along the drug development spectrum for, from preclinical to phase one to phase three. All right, so what do we want to know? Of course, we want to know what the uh, benefit risk uh, profile lo looks for, for a given patient. And so we know that for a uh, given regimen, we can have effects, yeah, both desirable as well as undesirable effects. And so ultimately, we want to optimize that spectrum between, OK, we want to have our patient to receive the full treatment benefit without uh, having some effects. What uh, do clinicians want to know? That's, of course, uh, important, because ultimately, uh, they are clients, if you will. And so uh, we can put like all the information that we want into a drug label or uh, make fancy dosing recommendations. If a physician doesn't apply it because it's too complex or too impractical, then all, all of that is a bit of use. So uh, one of the things that physicians typically want to know, what is a reasonable initial dosing regimen? So what do I start my patients off with? And are there any intrinsic or extrinsic factors, so for example, genetic factors, age, sex, uh, that I need to account for in order to adjust the dose management? Of course, a couple of other questions, but I don't want to get into greater detail. Um, how certain do we need to be? So again, I said for a given dose, we have a probability of uh, effects and, and side effects 
So I, uh, typically, the effect curve is uh, on the left here. And then hopefully, there is uh, a, a certain window here uh, where then the uh, efficacy curve is then followed by the safety curve. And then you, of course, want to uh, identify a dose where you receive close to maximum effect without any side effects. What are we willing to assume? Well, we know that um, our body consists of uh, typically 12 organ systems, with the exception of pregnancy, there's uh, a 13th organ system. And we know that, that these organs are connected by uh, uh, arterial and venous blood flow. There are certain volumes and uh, uh, tissue sizes that need to be considered. You can go as, as, uh, as complex as characterizing the whole body physiology. In many cases, that is not needed. So you can get like approximations of how a drug distributes in order to get a, an idea of the concentration response relationship. But you may want to be very careful if you compartmentalize uh, your body, because otherwise you may end something up with something like that, that what we would call a one compartment model. So they basically lump the whole body together and then say, OK, I'm, I'm just given the drug in here. And then it's cleared. Whether or not this is reasonable or effective of reality, this is a different story. Yeah. All right. So as I said, uh, at the end of that particular day, you want to integrate all available information. And typically, we do this via clinical trial simulations. So where you uh, use information uh, on both the mean profile on a patient as well as the uncertainty around it, both on a between subject patient as well as unknown. Uh, uh, variability. Um, you want to then use uh, information on uh, the uh, protocol design. So, for example, if you want to decide like a clinical trial, how many visits do you want to have? How many treatments arms do you want to have? How long is the trial going to be? What's the appropriate sample size? Uh, do you have any information on, for example, dropout? So, is, for example, a dropout informative of non compliance of the patient or is it informative? of uh, undesired side effects, uh, that is uh, sort of drug, cost of the drug. And then, of course, you want to use like previous no uh, prior knowledge on uh, biomarker response uh, uh, to the treatment. And then uh, simulate out what the pr probability of a desired treatment response is for a given dosage. What impact does this have on uh, regulatory decision making? Well. In, in an ideal world scenario, so if you had like unlimited resources and enough patients at hand, you could of course test each and every scenario uh, in the clinic. Practically, that's of course not feasible, and to some extent, it's also un unethical. So you would want to reduce the number of trials uh, that you conduct and really try to optimize the experiments that you conduct. And so, from a regulatory perspective, you want to uh, conduct a trial, learn from it your knowledge, and then use it to waive unnecessary clinical trials. So this is heavily used, for example, in uh, bioequivalence. So for example, if you have like an originator drug uh, on, on the market, and you know the benefit-risk ratio uh, for a given dosing regimen really well, then there is no reason um, for a generic company to uh, redo all the clinical trials that have led to the originator drug approval. They say, OK, if I achieve approximately the same plasma concentrations, then it's reasonable to assume that is what affects. Uh, same concept applies, for example, to uh, special patient populations, such as uh, pediatrics, where it's very hard, very hard to recruit sufficient number of pediatric patients. So uh, you use prior knowledge from adult populations and then uh, predict out what your expectations are, then basically do a confirmatory small clinical trial. So actually, uh, in recent years, there is uh, a fourth question that has come to the table. And that is, of course, of course uh, who's going to pay for that? And that is becoming uh, more and more important because, as I said, it costs about $1.8 billion to, uh, to bring a new drug to the market. And I use this little cartoon here uh, where the physician says, this is one of these new miracle drugs. If you can afford it, afford it it's a miracle. Yeah? So it's, it's very, very important. And actually, health insurance companies and in other uh, in other countries, such as the UK, have started to uh, put reimbursement caps on, on medications. Say, okay, if it costs more, I think it was to more than twenty-five thousand pounds a year per medication. We are not just not going to reimburse uh, for it, and so um, then of course that puts uh, poses a challenge for for, for a patient. Uh, 
Right. Well, um, we know there's, of course, a, a couple of challenges. Uh, bio biology and, and patients are, are complex. There's a whole uh, plethora of uh, factors that play a role. Typically, the, the space that I'm working in, you see on the bottom right corner, so that we use information on the human disease biomarkers responses uh, and, and the drug. But of course, we know that there are a lot more factors involved and that need to be sufficiently considered. There's also um, other challenges that need to be considered. For example, when you look at uh, chronic progressive diseases, uh, such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, diabetes, or osteoporosis, where you have, for example, uh, drugs where the concentration time profile changes over the course of hours, so relatively quick. But then if you look at the respective uh, uh, pharmacodynamic markers that are used in clinical trials, so for example, uh, fasting plasma glucose, fasting serum insulin, or uh, um, HbA1c, that typically takes some time, so it can be minutes to hours for glucose and insulin. HbA1c can, stay, can take uh, days, weeks, or months uh, to change. And then ultimately, do you see changes in clinical outcome that may take years. So, for example, till you see like uh, uh, toxicity uh, in, in the kidneys, or till you see, for example, a, a, a vision loss. And then, for example, and then, then of course, that poses a challenge for drug developers because ultimately you would want to know what happens here on the right hand side in terms of outcome, but you would have to conduct very long and very large clinical trials uh, to, to tease that out. So then the question then, of course, is how can we make that, uh, these trials shorter, and can we use information on steps such as biomarker responses that can serve as surrogates of what happens down the line? Yeah? And so that quantitative modeling and simulation tools are, of course, uh, critical here um, to put this in context and uh, use this as decisions. I call this here reverse engineering strategies in drug disease modeling. So what we typically do is say, OK, if we have outcome data, then um, we can link this to a pharmacodynamic response on bi various biomarker levels. So for example, slow biomarkers, HP1C, and what is the relationship to fasting cell insulin and fasting plasma glucose? Ultimately, how is that then uh, influenced by the drug? So how are these uh, drug disease models uh, set up? Well, typically, you want to uh, establish a strictly quantitative relationship between the drug and the desired pharmacodynamic effect. You can do this at uh, many uh, levels of, uh, uh, of various complexity. In the simplest case, we basically say, OK, um, the drug, once I take it, for example, orally, takes, uh, causes a certain rise and fall in concentrations in, in the blood that I can, can sample. And then I link it uh, to a biomarker response, which serves as a surrogate of an effect. I wanted to split this up. You can call it pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. But what is important is that you integrate information on the, on the two of them. Yeah? None of them are in isolation or, uh, uh, of telling the full story. So for example, if you take a drug, it may very well be in your body. But if you have a, a mutation in your pharmacodynamic target in the receptor, that does not allow the drug to bind to it. So for example, HER2 uh, mutations, then um, you can have all the drug that you want in your body. It's not going to be any good. Yeah. Just experience side effects, uh, there's no real benefit. And then of course, you want to consider how this relationship changes, for example, between healthy subjects and patients. So what I um, want to do now is I want to go through like a, a a couple of uh, hierarchical steps of complexity using type 2 diabetes uh, as an example. So uh, just a couple of words on the disease. It's a chronic progressive disease. Uh, it's one of the top 10 leading causes of death. Type 2 is the, so it's not a homogeneous disease. It's a heterogeneous disease, and type 2 is the most uh, common form. And to date, about 8 to 10 percent of the global population, <coughs> adult population, and more and more children are affected by that as well. So it's about 400 million people are affected by type 2 diabetes mellitus. And this is uh, expected to rise to about 600 million people by 2035. And uh, uh, about 11% of the global healthcare budget were spent in 2013 uh, on the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, 
And so the estimated cost for that is about $550 billion. Yeah, it's, not, it's not a spelling mistake, it's billion, not million. So it's a huge social economic impact. Uh, this is just a map here, so how type 2 diabetes uh, distributes uh, across the world. There are differences, of course. What I was uh, surprised to learn that not, for example, Europe or the United States are the most prevalent uh, areas for type 2 diabetes mellitus, but here, the Western Pacific area, there's a huge, huge problem. Where is that? Sorry. Uh, where, where, where was the... This is from the West, Western Pacific area here. Western Pacific. And then it's also expected that, for example, in the Middle East and uh, in India, China, are going to have a huge problem over the next couple of years uh, with respect to type 2 diabetes mellitus. All right, so if you wanted to start, then uh, to, to model that, uh, where would you start? Uh, I would argue by implementing knowledge on the underlying pathophysiology. And so the uh, goal of typical anti-hyperglycemic uh, drug uh, interventions is to maintain uh, a glycemic homeostasis. And so we need to consider, for example, um, the, the fact that we have uh, insulin secreted uh, from the pancreas, which of course then uh, uh, controls uh, glucose uptake into tissues, and then also that we have here uh, gluconeogenesis, uh, which then of course then also contributes to um, the uh, circulating the glucose concentrations. Um, as I said, biomarkers are really, really important uh, for modeling because they basically give you like a snapshot of how the system behaves. And so, uh, in general, they are defined as characteristics that are objectively measured and evaluated as indicators of normal biological processes, uh, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological responses to therapy interventions. So if you look at uh, type 2 diabetes, then HbA1c is, in fact, not just a biomarker. It's uh, accepted by regulatory agencies as a so-called so surrogate marker. So it's an approvable endpoint for uh, drug developers in, uh, in the diabetes space. And then we have the short-term algal fasting, uh, plasma glucose and plasma cell insulin, and I gave you a little bit of information here on uh, their respective kinetics. So, as I said, we can establish these models at various levels of complexity. So what has been done previously, uh, just say, okay, let's still use clinical trial data, uh, for example, fasting plasma glucose. This here is time over months. The dots uh, represent uh, individual patient level data. Uh, so you see this is really, really variable. And then just let, let's fit a regression model to it and say, OK, this is a change from baseline, so FBH10. <coughs> we have the disease progression factor, alpha. And then we have a function of treatment uh, uh, to, to model this data. And we see that the uh, model does a reasonably good, good uh, job characterizing the data, but this factor alpha, first of all, is a hybrid constant that doesn't tell us anything about the rate at which the disease progresses. And then, of course, uh, it does also not allow us to, for example, distinguish between subpopulations here that would explain the huge variability that you, that you see in the data. So this type of models were or are still used for quantifying treatment response, typically from a regulatory or regulatory point of view. That's done as a delta from placebo, and that uh, this type of models we use for dose selection and clinical trial design. Um, as I said, the face limitations uh, um, with respect to complex multi level disease processes. You know, remember, type 2 diabetes is not a homogeneous disease, that mm -hmm. if patient subpopulations, and if you just use a, a heavy factor, you have no chance of getting um, And so the also, if there's a patient's impact on the C status or treatment response. So, as a consequence, uh, more mechanistic modeling approaches are needed to explain the dynamic interaction between drug, biological system, and underlying disease processes. So, if you wanted to do this in a stepwise fashion, then you could say, okay, so what happens now after I, I swallow the tablet? So, how much drug does show up at the target site? And target site is, uh, in many, many cases, not in, in blood or plasma, most of the drug targets uh, sit in tissues. So how much unbound drug, pharmacologically active drug, does end up in the tissue? 
and uh, physiologic based pharmacokinetic modeling has emerged there really over the last decade as a prevalent tool uh, to uh, explain that. And I will have uh, a couple of examples uh, later on to, to show you. So once the drug is at the target, uh, how much of the drug uh, binds to it and what happens in terms of uh, target regulation? So we need to know a little bit about receptor theory. And then um, not all drugs have an immediate effect. There is, for example, um, intracellular action for, so for example, switch on protein synthesis, such as uh, for, for steroids, that will ultimately uh, mediate the pharmacodynamic. We also need to acknowledge the fact that this is not a one-way street. We are uh, working in biological systems, so there is typically homeostatic feedback, uh, which tries to maintain the, the system at a certain set point. So for example, body temperature is a good example where you have a very tight window. And then, of course, as I said, we need to uh, uh, consider uh, how, what impact uh, disease will have on, on, uh, on the system. Again, if you wanted to split this up here, the front end here would be your pharmacokinetic modeling, and the back end here would be uh, the pharmacokinetic modeling. If you wanted to link this to biomarkers, then uh, my previous uh, postdoc mentor has uh, proposed a um, scheme of biomarkers where he characterized uh, seven different types of biomarkers. And you will see that the first four go very much in hand with that conceptual picture here. And then, of course, you can expand it in terms of type 4 pathophysiological uh, response, genome and phenotype, of course, play a role, and then clinical response. So if you wanted to take this forward, then um, covariates and so factors such as demographics or genetics that influence the PK are typically quite well understood at the end of a drug development program. And so to give you an example here, so for different anti-diabetic drugs, in terms of uh, glomerular filtration rate and chronic kidney disease. So you see the worse the, uh, uh, the kidney function, so you either lead to, to dose reduction or they are contraindicated in the first place. Um, so this is typically quite well understood. The scenario is somewhat different if you look at uh, pharmacodynamic variables, and this is um, a very hot area at this point. So in terms of tissue banking, and then see, uh, for example, uh, three or four years down the line once a patient has developed, for example, certain disease symptoms, if there are any um, particular genetic or non-genetic factors that will explain that. Yeah. So, but typically, this is not quite well understood. And this is a, a, an area of systems pharmacology or systems biology modeling um, can play an important role. Um, then, of course, um, when we say, OK, but then let's expand our original uh, glucose hemostasis model. Then we know that, for example, food intake uh, plays a role. So if you wanted to make this uh, more complex, then of course we would have to uh, consider um, action, uh, drug action or physiologic action, GI tract, uh, which then has also led then to uh, the uh, modeling of novel uh, anti-diabetic agents, so like uh, GLP-1s or, or gastric inhibitory uh, peptides. And that can then be incorporated into the model. And so you may see that you know, this uh, stepwise more complex. This is a, a respective uh, depiction of the structural model. And this is then how the characterization of the concentration time profile will look like. Again, uh, the, 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 pot, the dots here are the, the observations. And then here's the mean model predicted the line, as well as then the fifth and then the fifth uh, percentile of the predictions. And you can do this for both glucose and insulin. Uh, and all the symptoms simultaneously considering the uh, homicidal feedback that you have. So this, uh, to summarize, these uh, mechanism-centric models are currently used to characterize the dynamic interaction between drug biological systems and, uh, 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 and the disease at multiple biomarker levels. They can be used to evaluate the effect of single as well as combination therapy. And they can be used to distinguish between treatment effects given that you have an appropriate study design. So for example, you can distinguish between a symptomatic and a disease-modifying intervention. Um, they face also limitations uh, when you look at uh, multiple disease pathways. Um, again, uh, if you have a very heterogeneous uh, population, and uh, so far, they are primarily 
focus on the characterization of drug efficacy. So if you wanted to ex uh, expand this uh, to drug safety, particularly with respect to off-target safety, uh, then you need uh, much more mechanistic approaches. So then the next step would then, of course, okay, let's look at the uh, entire set of networks rather than pathways. So where you acknowledge that depending on, on the dose of the drug that you give, it can hit multiple targets and can cause multiple effects. Then genes and environment uh, play a role. And then you have a highly dynamic uh, system which can have changing response over the course of time. So this is a, a just a snapshot of how this type of models uh, would look like. Um, so we have the individual components of the overall system, so-called nodes, and then in, in combination, uh, they would uh, characterize the dynamics of the overall system. So this is something that is uh, uh, currently um, used in, in preclinic drug development, for example, for target identification primarily, um, but not used uh, to, a, to a whole lot or to a large extent at late stage or drug development. So, they characterize burden and physiology that comprise uh, key pathways or targets of interest. They quantitatively integrate relevant uh, information about across biological systems, and they, they primarily used for exploratory purposes. As I said. So, um, on the flip side, um, you saw the complexity of these models. So, they face limitations with respect to their applicability to clinical trial data. So, for example, if you have and an outpatient in a phase three clinical trial uh, that comes to the clinic every three to six months, then you're not going to generate enough data to inform that type of yeah. So this is, of course, then, then a challenge of how to deal with that. If you use param parameter values from the literature to inform these models, then you have to be very careful about the uh, respective source of the data. Is it a reliable source? What are the experimental conditions? Are they accurately reflective of what I'm trying to achieve? And then uh, link, links to long-term clinical outcome uh, are typically also missing because the more granular you do the uh, characterization of the systems, that's typically on very short time scales. So in milliseconds or minutes, what happens uh, three years down the road is, is in many cases not very well understood. So as a consequence, simplified versions of these network-centric uh, models um, have been used and developed uh, to uh, characterize the key dynamic properties, and then make the simplified models uh, applicable to clinical trial data. All right, so let's, let's pause here for a second. Are physiologically based models uh, using information on metabolic and transport networks? I would say yes, they are. So could one call them network-centric or systems pharmacology models? I would say yes, we can. And so in many, many cases of physiology-based pharmacokinetic models uh, represent the front end to systems biology or systems pharmacology models. So how, how, do, they, how do they work? Well, as I said, uh, physiology-based pharmacokinetic models basically distinguish between uh, biological system-specific information and drug-specific information and then trial-specific information. So systems biology or system-specific information uh, takes advantage of our knowledge on the underlying biology, so on how many organs we have, uh, what the respective blood flows are, are um, how big the respective organs are, and then we can set the system up and then inform it uh, with uh, drugs, so basically probe the system, uh, giving different dosing routes, so for example here from intravenous dosing route or from oral dosing route, and also then consider uh, the respective elimination pathways. So uh, for example, here would be a ring clearance pathway. This would be a metabolic pathway. This could be, for example, uh, the pre-systemic clearance in the test phase. And so given together, you set up a physiology-based uh, model. Uh, and then on top of that, you, of course, uh, need to have your patient. And then you can distinguish here and I've taken this uh, from Ping Zhao's publication. He's the uh, PBPK expert at the US Food and Drug Administration. Uh, you can distinguish it here between uh, intrinsic factors, so for example, age, race, organ function, uh, gender, 
and extrinsic factors. So we know that, uh, for example, I, environment uh, plays a role. So does the subject smoke? Uh, do they drink? Uh, are there any uh, other environmental factors? Are there co-medications that, for example, that interact um, with the, the drug that we're currently selling? And so we can integrate all of uh, this information into a, a single modeling approach to then predict um, what happens uh, in a given uh, subset of, of patients. And so this is, of course, not a one-off approach. Uh, typically, it takes a couple of refinement cycles to get uh, the, these models up and running. So it's predict, learn, confirm, and ultimately, you also would want to apply these models because, as I said, if not applied, then it's, at least from my point of view, more a hobby than, than science. All right, so how are these uh, PPK models uh, currently used by sponsors? So this is data coming out of the US uh, Food and Drug Administration. And uh, you see that in 2012 and 2013, uh, the vast majority of physiology-based pharmacokinetic models was used to study uh, drug drug interactions, followed then by pediatric applications. And uh, pediatric applications are, are uh, rising. Uh, and that has a very distinct reason. And the reason is that uh, the law has changed in that regard. And now uh, drug, development, drug developers are required to hand in uh, pediatric uh, drug development plans at the end of their phase uh, two clinical trials in the US. So how they want to study the drug in, in, in kids, uh, if applicable, of course. And uh, Europe is even more stringent, so they have to present regulators at the end of phase one clinical trials with a respective development plan. So this is probably gonna, uh, gonna further increase. And then, we, of course, you have uh, mixtures between drug drug interactions and, for example, pharmacogenomics uh, or drug drug interactions and pediatrics. All right, so you, of course, then also can expand this to a pharmacokinetic or physiology based pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic uh, model. So when you here have the classical uh, setup of, a, uh, of the system specific parameters, and then of course uh, you can parameterize this to specifically uh, address your uh, diabetic questions. So for, here, for example, here after intravenous input or after oral dosing, where the intestine plays a role, uh, you can have also then here uh, simulate then what would happen if you additionally give uh, insulin, and you can then also apply to special patient populations. So for example, if you knock out your pancreas, that will then simulate uh, type one uh, diabetic patients. So there's a whole uh, variety of, of opportunities that, uh, that, that, that that you can explore here. And so this is uh, very very flexible. It makes it a powerful uh, tool not for uh, posterior hypothesis testing, but for prospective hypothesis generation. All right, so I'd like to uh, take now a few minutes to um, uh, present a, a couple of, of projects. I think I, I, I pulled out two here of uh, projects that we have completed in my lab. And uh, one is a project on uh, drug drug interactions and gene drug interactions. And the reason is that um, Pharmaceutical companies <coughs> basically have to study, <coughs> excuse me, have to study the drug drug interaction potential uh, during uh, clinical drug development. So, for example, if you have a drug that is uh, met uh, metabolized by cytochrome 3A4, then the question would then be, um, what would happen if you took that drug uh, in, in clinical practice with, for example, mm -hmm. a strong inhibitor of uh, 3A4? So, would you have to adjust the dose? We have to contraindicate a drug, what, what happens for moderate inhibitors. Yeah, and the same, of course, happens uh, for other cytochrome pathways. There are a couple of um, very um, highly polymorphic pathways that are typically uh, 2C9, 2C19, and, and 2D6. And so then the question is, if um, I had, for example, information from a drug drug interaction study in the presence of a strong inhibitor, would I have to study conceptually the same scenario uh, for uh, patients that have a genetic, genetic polymorphism in, in their um, respective cytogram pathways. So for example, if they were a poor metabolizer for 2D6 or 2C19, so whether basically by genetic polymorphism that pathway has been knocked out, or can I borrow that information from that drug drug interaction study and say, okay, this is what I think happens, and then 
uh, label um, the, the drug accordingly. And so the way we uh, approach this here is that we, of course, uh, first talk to the US uh, Food and Drug Administration. In the end, that was a project that was co-sponsored by the US Food and Drug Administration. And if you look at the respective labeling recommendations for drug drug and action studies and highly polymorphic uh, gene drug and action studies, then you will find that the uh, labeling language is, is typically similar. It's not necessarily the same, but it's similar. So what we looked at, and I mentioned that, uh, we looked at uh, three specific pathways, 2D6, 2C9, and 2C19, and we used uh, prototypical uh, victim drugs uh, for these pathways. Uh, we collected um, information from the literature on both uh, drug recognition studies and gene recognition studies for the three pathways, and we did a two-fold or two-step analysis approach. One was a descriptive or simply statistical convergence analysis, and the second one was a physiologic-based convergence analysis. So um, we selected for um, these three, three pathways, we selected um, prototypical uh, substrate drugs. So for 2D6, this were metoprolol, dextrometaphon, atomoxetine, and rotoxetine, 2C9, morphine, flobiprofen, celecoxib, and 2C9, omeprazole, and clopidogrel. Um, we selected these drugs um, basically uh, for this prototypical study due to the fact that more than 80% of these drugs are metabolized by the single pathway. And then we selected uh, strong inhibitors for these pathways from the literature, so it was peroxidine, duoxid, trinidine, and cuprion, for 2 6 fluconazole for 2C9, and then fluconazole, fluoxetine, and omeprazole for 2C9. So we selected uh, or we collected information on uh, poor metabolizer studies from the literature, so to account for gene drug action studies, and then for strong inhibitors to account for drug interactions. And we com uh, compared the uh, respective uh, AUC ratios um, for uh, drug drug interactions, and then used the uh, gene drug interactions um, as a reference and then computed the respective drug drug and action, gene drug and action, uh, uh, AUC ratio that corresponds to that. In parallel, we set up a physiologically based pharmacokinetic models. We set up one for the, for the victim drug, so the drug that is being metabolized, by uh, integrating physiochemical properties, metabolizing uh, metabolism data, so the max KM values, and scale this up to vivo, and then clinical trial observation, then we qualify the model, and then we simulate it out using this uh, model what would happen for gene drug interaction study by knocking out the enzyme, or would, and then overlay it with the respective drug drug interaction studies, or simulate it out drug drug interaction studies and overlay it with the gene drug interaction data. And so if the respective model simulations were contained within a 90% prediction interval, then we uh, include the respective. If you look at the respective results from our um, uh, statistical analysis, then we saw that the, the um, story seemed relatively straightforward for 2D6. Uh, so we had uh, convergence for all drug, drug, uh, gene drug and action pairs. And that seems to be due to the fact that for 2D6, if you have a um, loss of function polymorphism, then we really knock out the, the enzyme completely. Whereas for uh, 2, 2C9 and 2C19, there's leftover enzyme activity, or you don't have a strong enough uh, inhibitor that's dosed high enough to knock all the uh, enzyme activity out. So what we saw then for, for 2C9 was interesting. Uh, typically, uh, fluconazole doses, uh, 200 milligram that are also used in the clinic, uh, were not high enough uh, to knock the uh, 2C9 pathway out completely. So our recommendation to the regulator was then to use the 400 milligram doses if they want to uh, study this type of scenario. And for 2C19, an additional level of complexity uh, came into the picture, which was that, um, so we did not see a convergence for fluconazole, but we see one for omeprazole, but not other proton pump inhibitors. And that is most likely due to the fact that uh, there are two forces at play one is the uh, 2C19 interaction, and the other one is likely to be a change 
in a gastric pH due to the proton pump inhibitor, uh, which then uh, uh, changes the solubility of, of the drug. And so in combination, that seems to make a significant difference for meprosol, but it's not uh, important enough for other proton pump inhibitors, which is in line with the, uh, for example, Canadian guidelines on the use of uh, clopidogrel, where omeprazole is contraindicated, whereas other proton pump inhibitors are, are used. So if we then look at the respective uh, PPPK uh, modeling results, then we'll see here the you have the concentration here for tamoxetine in the, in the top left graph on the y-axis over time. The uh, solid green line is the mean model predicted line. The uh, dashed lines are the fifth and 95th percentile uh, of, of the predictions. And then you have here information from orange uh, from the uh, drug drug and extra study <coughs> and the blue triangles here for our, the cheap drug and extra studies and they're all contained uh, within the uh, prediction interval. And so therefore the GDI as well as the DDI simulations and for all of these four, uh, four scenarios that works out beautifully so we conclude conversions. And so the end of the story was that uh, uh, drug drug action data can be used to inform uh, labeling for what would happen for genetic polymorphisms. If we look at uh, sub 2C19, we see that here 40 uh, uh, 200 milligram dose. Um, this is a borderline case. And some of the observations lie, lie outside the, the model predictions, whereas as you increase the dose, then uh, you achieve conversions. So, um, key messages uh, for the study post descriptive and PVK based convergence analysis uh, show that drug drug connections for sub 2D6 substrates using strong sub 2D6 inhibitors can be used to inform gene drug connections. Situation is more complex for 2C9 and 2C19. The potency, dose, and dose of the inhibitor for drug drug connections, as well as the remaining enzyme activity for loss of function, carriers, and other those gene drug connections is important. Um, and so uh, the, the approach that we are presenting was seen as a valuable addition to uh, clinical testing because you may just be able to just give uh, prospective clinical trials. And typically, one of these trials is between one and three million dollars a piece. Uh, the second uh, case example that I want to look at is, is acetaminophen uh, Tylenol. Why do I care about Tylenol? Well, it's it's very widely available. Uh, it's uh, used in, in more than a hundred uh, drug products. It's available over the counter. But what you may or may not know, it's also the drug that is. Uh, associated with the highest risk of liver toxicity of any over-the-counter drugs out there. And that is not due to acetaminophen, but it's due to its uh, uh, toxic metabolite, NAPQI, that binds covalently to the liver and then uh, causes uh, apoptosis here. And then risk factors include uh, age, co-medication, alcohol intake. And so the question we had is the current dosing regimen that is based on adult data is that uh, appropriate for children or should they be adjusted? And the um, approach that we had taken is to develop a physiologic based pharmacokinetic model that accounts for maturation of changes in metabolic pathways from birth. Yeah? Not just down to the age of like seven, but down to the age of the eight. And so um, this is a different depiction of uh, PPK models. So here is your system specific information in the middle, and you can use this for uh, animal to human scaling, but also so for between species scaling, but also for within species scaling. And what you also can do is then to account for autogeny and in, in, uh, enzyme expression and activity. So both in terms of uh, uh, phase one as well as uh, phase phase two enzymes. And so basically what we did here is we started out uh, collecting the physical chemical properties um, of acetaminophen um, from the literature, established the mass balance, and developed then a model uh, in adults that was then uh, informed by uh, clinical trial data from uh, adults uh, uh, after taking intravenous or um, oral acetaminophen. And then basically scaled uh, system specific parameters for differences in body size, differences in blood flow, for example, uh, 
but also uh, differences in, in enzyme expression levels for both, for both phase one and phase two enzymes simulated out what we would expect of the oral and uh, parental administration. So to qualify the model in, in, uh, in pediatric patients and then use it, then, and then it is intended for subsequent um, recommendation of appropriate doses in children. So these are some of the results uh, that, that we got. So we have here again on the y-axis, we have the concentration of time on the x-axis, and the dots are the observations from the literature, and then the uh, solid line is the mean prediction line, dash line, fifth and ninety fifth percentile of, of the predictions. And we see that our model does a good job predicting the, the observations that were not used for model building, so they're just used for, for, for overlaying uh, what we predicted for different um, uh, dose strengths, so for five uh, mg per kg, 20 mg per kg, uh, for IV, uh, for solution, tablets, and serves. So this is for different uh, clinical trials. And then we, when we scaled this to, to children, it did do uh, an equally uh, good job for characterizing what would happen here in neonates, infants, children, and, and adolescents, both of the intravenous and uh, oral administration. So we published that in, in 2013, and this uh, work is now used at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as an internal case study of how uh, this type of model um, should be established. So then, of course, uh, we say, okay, do we need to be that complex, <coughs> or can we get a very uh, simple approach? So when we simulate out the respective uh, acetaminophen clearance using our PPPK model for uh, patients at various ages, then we get here that solid black line. And remember, that model is basically uh, established using adult clinical data, so 20 years and older, and was then able to predict uh, changes in acetaminophen clearance down to the age of neonates. And then when we compare it to uh, actually estimated uh, acetaminophen uh, clearance based on actual clinical trial data, then we see that our predictions are very, very close. Yeah, so the stash lines here are from clinical trials from the Netherlands, where they actually measure clearance and our predictions will be basically small. So where do we stand? Well, what, what we can do now is basically characterize the uh, formation of the active metabolite and the change in kinetics of the, of, the, of the parent compound. But what we cannot do yet is, uh, uh, is basically, and that's the uh, uh, step that we're currently working on, is um, characterize to a sufficient extent the detoxification of the toxic metabolite by the glutathione pathway, and then to ultimately predict uh, the uh, cell death. But that's something that we're actively working on with a couple of academic and industry collaborators who will hope to have this uh, wrapped up uh, relatively soon. So at the end of my talk, um, I just um, want to also give you some, some background on the remaining uh, center uh, faculty. And I will also share the slides, so no reason to spend a lot of time on that. Again, the center was founded by uh, Dr. Larry Desco. He used to be the um, director of the uh, Office of Clinical Pharmacology at FDA for almost 20 years uh, before basically semi-retiring and coming to UF uh, five years ago and starting the center. Um, Myself uh, coming on board as his first faculty, and I listed here uh, basically my, my research interests and my contact information. Uh, we have uh, with Dr. Polita, uh, a preeminent uh, faculty um, in, in, in our midst that is primarily focused on antibiotic uh, research. Uh, Dr. Trame uh, came from, from Europe and did a postdoc at, uh, in, in Sweden with Mitz Carlson also one of the um, thought leaders in our field. And she applies uh, modeling simulation primarily to, to drug safety. And then Dr. Biarrell is, is here, so if you have any questions, uh, please ask. And uh, she's, uh, she's an expert in the oncology arena uh, for identifying uh, most appropriate single as well as combination therapies using both uh, in vitro as well as clinical data. Um, so summary thoughts. If you want to go uh, fast, go alone. If, if you want to go far, go together. So I think a cross-talk between disciplines is needed. One of the reasons, again, why I'm here today. 
Um, it is very important to try to understand the dynamics of the system. The fact that you have data does not necessarily mean that you can answer like all the questions uh, that you have. You want to make sure that also the parameter estimates that you're getting out of your model are physiologically meaningful. And uh, no single model can answer all the questions. Um, so you need to make sure uh, that you understand and formulate your questions that you have uh, appropriately and clearly and let the question drive the complexity of the model and not the other way around. So models should be fit for purpose. And I think Einstein even said, you know, if I had like an hour to live, I would need to answer like a question. I would probably spend 55 minutes trying to find out what kind of question I would want to ask and then spend five minutes to answer it. And with that, I'm open for questions. I have a question. <clears throat> um, what, what exactly, I don't know if I can frame it right, but um, what are these models actually from a mathematical point of view made up? Because you have all of these networks, mm -hmm. but at some point, you, you do quantitative work on the like the typical differential equations. They're typically they ordinary, factor, typically right? ordinary differential equations. Oh, okay. So they ultimately reduce to to differential mm -hmm. equations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we have also uh, in the, if you have very simple scenarios, we can have also closed form solutions. Um, but typically, they're ordinary differential equations. Um, some of the of the models, physiologically based models in particular are also available in commercially uh, available software platforms. So there's basically four main providers out there. And one is SimSip, GastroPlus, uh, PKSim, and, and uh, a spin-off for MATLAB SimBiology. Uh, so that's commercially available, and we work basically with, with all of them. And we have also uh, contributed to um, uh, qualifying the periodic modules, both for small and large molecules. So that's a type of an action that we're working at. But there's, of course, also um, other platforms out there. So we use R quite frequently on MATLAB. So where we uh, code these things completely uh, on our own. So yeah. So every one of the most big uh, link networks, like so one of them was very, very large. I think mm -hmm. the one you did on diabetes, it was very, anyway, you showed sure it was very, very large. But there was one, remember, where you said, this is the piece that we work on, mm -hmm. right? And it was a very big, so every one of those represents a kind of System of differential yes. equations. Yes, they're, they're, all, they're, they're all linked all okay. in the sense. Yeah. All right. yeah, so I can see why you would need to simulate this. There's mm -hmm. no way you can solve those yes. directly because there must be hundreds of, of variables. Absolutely. Okay. So, also, uh, an, another aspect that we are working on is um, again, use this, this model for prospective hypothesis generation and, and, and say then, um, uh, what are the the factors that drive the dynamics of the system, and so by definition, they should also be linked then to informative biomarkers that would also then give you uh, an idea of the type of variability that, that you can expect in clinical trials. Any other questions? Uh, I'm just curious as to why, uh, given the uh, the uh, potential toxicity of acetaminophen is, is so often prescribed in hospitals? It's a good question. Um, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I personally try to stay away from it. Mm -hmm. Well, my wife takes a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, what, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a huge problem, particularly in uh, chronic pain. Um, I mean, the, the alternative is to, to switch, for example, to ibuprofen, which may or may not be strong enough, or to, to opioid analgesics. And uh, if you follow the, um, the current press on, on opioid analgesics, there seems to be, an, I guess, an epidemic out there with respect to uh, opioid addiction. We are working with a, with a pain clinic in, in Ocala, uh, where we also use the, this, this type of models to, um, uh, to discriminate um, um, whether a patient has, has taken a drug, if there's certain uh, co-medications or genetic factors that would basically lead to an increased risk of uh, dependence uh, development. So these are the type of, of questions that we're working on. Yes. Yes. Well, 
Yes, there, there are, for example, I mean, glutathione, as far as I'm concerned, is, is a general detoxification pathway. Right. And um, there, there are cases, for example, um, where if you look in the literature where you have uh, patients with asthma, for example, that have an infection or, and then in addition take, take acetaminophen, then basically that glutathione uh, pool gets, gets exhausted and uh, you see like increased incidence of asthma attacks. So that, yeah, that, there's uh, some evidence out there. To what extent this holds true or not, we have a clinical, a clinical data set in, in over 100 children where we look at uh, adult formation with respect to right of administration at different dose strengths, both therapeutic as well as super therapeutic, and uh, we we'll hope to, to get this in the public domain pretty soon. So just to, I guess just to clarify my understanding, so for the acetaminophen, you have the adults that have the clinical trials, and you develop the models that incorporate the different age groups below the adults yes. uh, to to estimate kind of how they can metabolize. Yes. And with that, that uh, the graph where says liters per hour of the acetaminophen, uh, does that indicate that the younger children metabolize the acetaminophen faster yes. than than adults? So. As far as dosage implications, um, when when you because I'm guessing I'm asking this more as a parent uh, of, uh, of children who are in that age range that you were uh, uh, trying to estimate, um, as far as the dosages on the package, um, uh, how what is the takeaway from a parent's perspective or my perspective of yeah. of your research as, in comparison as, to what's on the as package? As I said, I, I, I dare not to draw ultimate conclusions to that yet because basically what we can characterize is the age-dependent formation of the metabolite, but we, we don't have the, the detoxification mapped out in, in that type of detail Okay. because it's basically formation and elimination and uh, we don't have the elimination quite figured out yet. Okay. Are you working on simulating other drugs besides acetaminophen? Yes. Or? Yeah, because uh, typically Pediatric drug development, what you, what you have quite frequently standard approach is what we would call elementary scaling. So that's a basic scale by, by body weight. Mm -hmm. uh, and that typically works quite well down to the age of two. Uh, and that has, uh, has to do with the fact that um, uh, typically cytochrome enzymes are mature um, uh, at the age of two. Uh, UGT is not necessarily. So I think UGT 2P15. I think it uh, was fully fully mature at the age of 15. So so for phase one, it seems to work quite well. For phase two, it doesn't. Um, there's also, um, you have also a publication out there where you have changes in, in oral drug absorption in the first week of after birth. You know, so that uh, that plays a role, but that seems to be more a, a mechanical, so basically the, the gut coming online rather than an, an enzyme phenomenon. Yeah, I, going back to the the system equation. How big are these systems? I mean, do you do them on a, like a, a a good desktop, or do you need a supercomputer? You know, how how much computation is involved? Well, it it, it depends a little bit. Uh, we have uh, the way we are set up. Uh, we are connected through the Florida Lambda Rail to um, to the engineering cluster in, in, in Gainesville, to the Hypergator, and uh, so we have capacity there to to do more extensive simulation work. Uh, we have also a small cluster, I guess I shouldn't say so if you have that. So we have also a cluster in-house and uh, some of this is also uh, uh, based on cloud computing. Yeah, but you're but you're right, I mean it can lead to very extensive Well yeah I'm just wondering yeah. what you know whether this is a kind of project from a collaboration point of view that you know you can do in your office or do you need, you know in other words, you're not going to do it on a laptop. You, need, you, you do need something fairly extensive. Yeah. Well, you, you can you can do it on a laptop uh, if, if you have remote access into some right. sort of right. service setting. Yeah. Right, if you have remote access to something. Yeah. <clears throat> and you guys, when you go to verify or justify or find the product or the product, do you guys do any of that work yourself, or is that purely taken from clinical trials or in feature of you know, data that we give you for something like that? It's a good question. We have uh, 
a, a bed lab uh, coming online uh, right now, so that you basically in the oncology and infective space uh, uh, measure cell counts, for example, or cytokine levels. Uh, as I said, I've also you know, been involved in a couple of, of clinical trials where we basically stuck a small probe into, for example, the thigh or the abdomen of a patient and then uh, measured uh, concentration in the, in, the, in, the, in the interstitial space fluid of, of, of these patients. Um, so, yeah, we, we also generate to some extent our own data, um, given that we uh, work very collaboratively with the pharmaceutical industry, we get access to quite a bit of their clinical trial data. So, for example, I have uh, access to the entire uh, diabetes portfolio of a pharmaceutical company with basically a couple of hundred thousand patient records. And which, 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 which is good if you want to train people in, in that regard or in, in this space, because um, I, I think during a PhD, for example, if you get like 12 patients in a clinical trial, I mean, that's, that, that's good, but may not serve the purposes that we have to. Any other questions? And also feel free to you know, come come by our shop in, in, in Lignona and uh, have a look. Also, if there's any interest uh, in you know, PhD, postdoc, let us know. Thank you very much.